I like this. This is an awesome mic. This is a great setup, right? So I have to tell you, I'm incredibly honored to be able to share the stage with my friend Robbie Kaplan. I've known Robbie since I was a baby lawyer, and she was a baby lawyer. Uh, I had the honor of starting my career at Paul Weiss, and so you do not have an unbiased stage here when it comes to the virtues of the firm that supported Robbie in this incredible litigation effort. And the first question that I want to ask, uh, one of the running themes of the book is it's all about Edie, stupid. And a lot of what I want to ask you about is the, 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 you know, the, the, the strategy and the sentiment that underlay that, uh, that mantra. But before I get to that, I want to ask you about the parts of the book that are about you. Because part of what Robbie does in, in the remarkable story that she tells in this book is you offer a very personal, revealing account about what this lawsuit meant to you as a woman, as a lesbian, as somebody who had uh, to resolve a lot of history with your own family. And it's an incredibly courageous piece of writing. And so I want to hear a little bit about that story and about why you decided to tell the story that way. So, you know, it's interesting. When I started to put the, when I came up with this idea for the book, which actually had something we were originally going to do with Edie uh, before we got a decision and kind of, it wasn't working out, and Edie didn't really like any of the writers of the proposal, so I kind of gave up on the idea of doing the book. And then uh, after the decision came down, I got approached by, and I was kind of wanted the right book and the right publisher, and, and uh, people came to me with this idea, and I decided to do it. And the original conception I had was really a legal book. It was not to tell anything personal. Um, it was really to tell the story of the case and how we won the case, and I wanted it to kind of be a record, I hoped, uh, for people in the future of at least one way to win a, a civil rights case, or to litigate a civil rights case. Uh, and then when we started to put together the chapters, I realized that I could not tell that story, and I couldn't tell it effectively without telling my own story. Um, and part of that is because the incredible, what's the incredible story here? The incredible story is that in our lifetimes, the world has completely changed, right? The, 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 what is totally normal and ordinary today with respect to gay people would have been and was extraordinary only a few years ago. Um, and, you know, I remember growing up in Cleveland in the 70s and hearing from Gloria Steinem, the personal is political. Um, you may not believe that about any, every issue, but when it comes to gay rights, the personal really is political. And I realized I just couldn't tell the story the right way without talking about um, the dramatic changes in my own life um, and how they changed throughout the course of the book and being able to compare that to Edie's life, because she obviously is a generation or two older than me, and, and kind of to see that passage of time in terms of the way gay people live their lives and in terms of the way Americans viewed gay people. Mm -hmm. And how much did you learn in the process of writing the book as opposed to in your representation and your friendship with Edie about her history? Was the, was the history in the book stuff that you already knew about Edie, or did you learn new stuff about Edie in the process of writing the book? I, the answer is probably both. Yeah. So, so uh, one of the things that I agree to, Edie was my client, obviously, and we have an attorney-client relationship, and I was very sensitive uh, in this book to that relationship. And one of the things we did to make sure that both we were comfortable and Edie was comfortable is to give her right to change anything in the book about mm -hmm. her history. So there are two chapters in the book that are really Edie's kind of story, and I would say it'd be fair to say Edie edited those sections 72 times. <laughs> so, um, um, so a lot of what's in there is stuff that I'd heard. I mean, Edie and I have spent, I mean, she's really a member of my family at this point. We've spent hundreds and hundreds of hours together. We celebrate ham, uh, holidays together, family occasions. She's like another grandmother to my son. So I've heard a lot of these stories. But even though I tried to write them as accurately as possible, she definitely found mistakes. So the answer is a lot of it I knew, but a lot of it she fixed um, in terms of the editing process. So part of the genius of the litigation strategy that you employed was making her story a centerpiece of the effort. And do you want to just tell us, for starters, a little bit about her story? Sure. So it's, it's an amazing story, obviously. Um, Edie uh, was born here in Philadelphia uh, in the Depression. Um, her family in a kind of a Jewish middle class family. Her father lost his business 
uh, during the Depression, and they had to move in with relatives. Um, and she went to Temple University, and while she was at Temple, she fell in love for the first time with a woman, and she knew she was a lesbian. Uh, but back then, uh, none of that relationship didn't work out, and no other relationship she had uh, with another woman at the time worked out, in large part because, as you can imagine, for two women back then, the idea of living their lives together was almost unheard of. So even though she'd been engaged in college and then broken off the engagement when she, she met this woman, she then, after college, got re-engaged to the same guy. That's how she has the name Windsor. Um, and they got married. Um, needless to say, uh, the marriage didn't last very long. It was only a matter of months. Um, Edie says that when she would go out with her husband on a Saturday night and she would see two women together, she would get jealous. Uh, and so after, uh, uh, after a while, she basically came out to her husband. She said, look, you deserve to be loved the way you really deserve to be loved, and I need something else. Um, I should say that they, they remained on good terms for many years. He, I think he called her on her 80th birthday or 75th birthday, um, and she's been in touch with his wife. So uh, fortunately, it was not a, a, a terrible thing for either of them. And she decided to move to New York uh, like so many people, including me, a few years later, in order to be gay. Um, when she got to New York, though, the bigger issue was not being gay, because anyone who was gay or lesbian at that point was totally in the closet, unless you, know, you were willing to really live on the margins of society. You had to be in the closet. So that wasn't the issue. The issue was that, as a woman, she had grown up assuming she'd get married and that her husband would support her. And now she had to figure out a way to support herself, and that wasn't so easy. So here's a, another fact I love. She had been good, according to her, and I'm sure it's true, at algebra in high school. So she decided to enter the mathematics graduate program at NYU, <laughs> um, and which she did, and she became one of the original um, first computer programmers really in the country. Um, believe it or not, computer programming back then was dominated by women. I mean, it's totally counterintuitive, but no one really knew that they, they were going to need software or that it was a big deal, so there a lot of women went into software. Um, and uh, she had a job working her way through also. She got a job on this computer called the Univac computer. It was then the biggest computer in the world. It took up a city block at NYU. Um, and one day she's sitting in her apartment on the Upper West Side. She gets a letter from the FBI. And the letter says, we need to talk to you about your Q, no pun intended, your Q security clearance to, to have this job. And we don't think you need a lawyer yet, but we'd like you to come talk to us. And Edie, rightly so, was petrified uh, because at that time uh, it was a crime, it was a felony uh, for anyone who was gay uh, or lesbian to have any employment with the federal government whatsoever. You couldn't even work for a company that had contracts with the federal government. Uh, and Edie said she was worried that they were on to her and that's what the letter was about. So she did some research. It turns out her research was correct. Uh, and that under New York law at the time, for a lesbian as opposed to a gay man, what was illegal is to dress or appear as a man. So she, she showed up at the FBI interview in high heels, a frilly dress and crinolines, hoping, as she said, to throw the FBI off their game. Um, fortunately for Edie, and I would say fortunately for the rest of the United States, the FBI didn't ask her if she was a lesbian. All they asked her about was her sister's friends who were members of the teachers' union, uh, thinking that they were communists. Um, she got her security clearance. She went on uh, to have a, a really incredible career at IBM. Um, and shortly after graduating, one day she was kind of back in New York City. She was lonely. Um, and she called up a friend and said, can you take me where the lesbians are? I need to go where the <laughs> lesbians are. And her friend took her to a restaurant in Greenwich Village that was then owned by Elaine Kaufman, who owned Elaine's, or managed by Elaine Kaufman, which is where lesbians went on Friday nights, apparently. Um, and at that restaurant, she met Thea Spire. Now, as far as Edie was concerned, it was love at first sight, but not so for Thea. Uh, and for the next couple years, Thea had a series of girlfriends, and Edie was always kind of waiting to see when Thea didn't have a girlfriend. And every time she thought Thea didn't have a girlfriend, she'd find out she had a new girlfriend. Until finally, she heard that Thea was truly single and was going out to the Hamptons for the weekend. So Edie called up some friends, not really friends, acquaintances she knew, and said, would you mind terribly if I came and stayed with you this weekend? 
She says, like, she says even today, she can't believe she had the chutzpah to do that. Uh, it's this great story I tell in the book where she's like waiting at their place for Siggy to show up and Thea doesn't show up and then she doesn't show up. She finally shows up like late on Saturday uh, and that was the beginning of their romance. Um, here's a truly incredible fact. Two years later, driving out to the Hamptons one weekend, uh, Thea said to her, you know, if you, got, if you were to get engaged, if I were to get you an engagement ring, could you wear a diamond ring to work at IBM? And Edie said, no, there's no way I could do that because if I did, everyone would say, who's the lucky guy? And I can't answer that question. So Thea pulled over by the side of the road, got down on her knees and pulled out a circular diamond brooch uh, that I hope one day will go to the Smithsonian uh, and said to Edie, will you marry me? And so began a 40 year engagement. Uh, the fact that, that two women in 1967, that's two years before Stonewall, in 1967 would even have the thought to say I want to get engaged is a fact that never ceases to amaze me. Uh, the truly heroic thing though about both of their lives is what happened for the next 40 years because not only did they stay together, uh, but Thea was diagnosed with MS and she had a very uh, terrible form of MS and over the course of time she lost the use of her arms and her legs. Uh, by the time she died she was a quadriplegic. And Edie has said that that diagnosis happened to both of us they had a post-it on their computer, on their refrigerator, excuse me, the post-it was on my computer, but on their refrigerator that said, seize joy. Um, and they really lived their life that way. So actually the day that Thea died, uh, she was a psychologist in New York City and she had two patients that day who she was supposed to see who had to be called. Um, and then the case happened because when she died, even though they were married, um, because of this little statute known as the so-called Defense of Marriage Act, uh, their marriage was invalid under federal law. And so all the property that they owned together, Edie had to pay an inheritance tax as if she'd inherited from a stranger. Uh, and that's when she decided she was gonna do something about it. And part of what she did about it, which was a fateful and historic decision, was to hire you as her lawyer, or rather to retain you as her lawyer. The high, the, the I cost didn't cost being, very much. The cost being zero dollars. Um, and can you tell us a little bit about so part of what you did in this lawsuit was to make the, the, you know, an even more fully realized version of that story from day one the centerpiece of the lawsuit. And that's not always the decision that lawyers make in cases in general and in civil rights cases in particular. And can you help us understand, number one, what are the sort of range of decisions and strategic choices that lawyers have to make when they frame a lawsuit, and number two, why you thought this was a lawsuit where putting the plaintiff's story front and center was so important. So I, I think it's really two things. So first of all, that's the way, to use a colloquial phrase, that's the way I roll. I mean, <laughs> you know this, Tobias. I mean, in a law firm like Paul Weiss, uh, we, are, we were both taught, born yeah. and bred, yeah. uh, that your job as a lawyer is to represent your client, and that's your job. Um, and all the other stuff out there, um, you kind of have to screen out to the extent you can, and you have to think in your case, how am I gonna win this case for my client? And it ended up being an enormous freedom for us in this case because while we certainly listened to other groups and we had to, we had interminable phone calls and we heard what everyone had to say, in the end when we made decisions, the decision was will this help Edie get her tax money back or not? And every decision we made was based on that. We didn't have to worry about donors or other groups or anything like that. It was solely based on that decision. So part of me was just, that's just how I've been taught and raised and that's the way I like to represent clients. Uh, but I had had a case in New York, um, while I think you were probably still Paul Weiss, the New York marriage case that I yeah. lost big time. It was right after I left. Right after um, I left. In 2006. Um, and that's actually why Edie had to go to Toronto to get married, it was my fault. I think, I, I think <laughs> I've kind of paid her back. But, um, and we lost that case big time and in that case, one of the reasons I think we lost is because like many of these cases, there were I think six plaintiff couples. We lost a couple along the way because they broke up. Um, but there were about six plaintiff couples and what I realized is that if you have a case with six couples, the problem is, and there's good reasons to do that because you, have, you represent the diversity of the community, but the downside is that the facts of those couples' lives faded into the background. And the case looked more like an abstract argument or a debate between pundits on Fox and MSNBC than a case about real people in their lives. And so the incredible thing about just having Edie and having Edie and Thea, and they 
you know, I don't mean to be cynical about this, but they weren't going to break up, Thea had passed away, um, is that you could really focus on their lives. And I, and I was convinced that the only way to, con that this is not a case about, frankly, about changing legal principles. This, if you read a brief in the New York case that we filed in 2006, it would look very much like the briefs that were filed in the Supreme Court last summer. Mm -hmm. Really not that different. The arguments hadn't changed. What's changed is the ability of people and judges to hear those arguments mm -hmm. and understand them. And how did we do that? We persuaded Americans that gay people have the same lives as everyone else and the same dreams and the same aspirations and the same relationships. And so focusing so laser in on Edie and Thea I think, I hope, enabled us really to do that. I wanted the justices to think to themselves, the relationship that Edie and Thea had was the same as the relationship they had with their spouses. Now, in order to get the case in front of the Supreme Court, in order for this to be the case, something else had to happen. And part of what Robbie tells in this book is this phenomenal inside baseball <laughs> story, which for you know a civil rights lawyer is just like Halloween, but for... <laughs> I think everybody is just a crash course in the, you know, the less talked about dimensions of litigation and what the various different goals and priorities are that you have in a lawsuit. And you moved heaven and earth to get this case to the front of the line. And help us understand, number one, why? <clears throat> and number two, how you went about doing it. So well, I have a son who's now nine, and when he was little, the, one of his favorite books I used to read to him was called A Dog Needs a Bone. Um, and I don't think it's a coincidence now that that was his favorite book. I'm definitely a dog who like, kind of chases a bone, and I don't give up until I get the bone. Um, and that was very much the way I litigated this case. So um, we had a couple things. First of all, Edie, thank God, she's 86 now, and we should all look like and act like she does at 86. But... Uh, she did have a serious heart condition. She had a heart attack after Thea died, uh, and she had two minor heart attacks during the case itself. Uh, so I was very, very worried during the case that I not only wanted her to be alive when it was over, but I wanted her to be healthy enough to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. um, and so very much on my mind from day one is we got to speed this up because I don't know how much time Edie has, and I want her, you know, the case would continue even if she had died, but I didn't want that to happen. So I did a lot of things <laughs> to speed up the case. One of them uh, is probably the funniest, is um, the district court judge who we got is an, a woman by the name of Barbara Jones. She's now retired. Um, I had had her in other cases, and, I, and she's a wonderful judge, but she was known as not exactly being fast in civil cases. She did not have what's called a rocket docket in civil cases. And I was very anxious to get her to decide. Uh, and so I started writing what, what my colleague Pam Carlin has called the Edie has the sniffles letters uh, <laughs> to Judge Jones. Literally, I think I wrote a dozen about them that would say things like, Dear Judge Jones, just want you to know, you know, Edie was in the hospital yesterday. I think she's better. You know, uh, very truly or respectfully submitted Robbie Kaplan. Or, Dear Judge Jones, Edie had an allergic reaction to her medication. <laughs> <laughs> she's been stuck in her apartment a couple of days. Again, I think she's okay. Just want you to know, respectfully submit it. Now, look, I know, I knew that Judge Jones, like, knew what was going on. And, and I knew her as a judge, and I knew she wouldn't hold it against Edie that we were doing that. Um, I've since talked to her about it because she's retired, and I said to her, what did you think? And she's like, I thought you were full of it, to be honest. She's like, I didn't even think you were. I said, no, everything in those letters was totally true. Um, so, but that was one of the things that we did to speed it along. The other thing, kind of as we got closer to the Supreme Court, is I, you know, I had never done a Supreme Court case before this case, but I have litigated for many years in New York, and I think I know the judges in New York. And when we got to the point where the Solicitor General had to choose between which case they thought the Supreme Court should take, um, I took the position that they should choose Windsor, not only because we had great facts, but because we would get a very fast decision from the Second Circuit. And I remember having a meeting with Sri Srinivasan, who was then the ass Assistant Solicitor General, he's now a judge in D.C., and him looking at me like I was crazy. And he said, well, you know, the Second Circuit, they're not going to decide fast. They'll probably stay this the way the Ninth Circuit did. And I said, and a part of me here was bluffing a bit, I have to say. I said, Sri... I said, I'm a New York lawyer. I know how things work in New York. We're going to get a very fast decision. Um, and we did. I got a decision. We got a decision from the Second Circuit from Dennis Jacobs three weeks after I argued the case, 
which you know, I can hear the, the expressions in the room. I mean, that is light speed in, in for a legal case. In fact, if you read the Windsor opinion in the Second Circuit, it doesn't even have the facts. Uh, Judge Jacobs went right to the law because I, I think he was very well aware of the timing. And I have to tell you, I remember when the Second Circuit opinion, and I, I, it took a while to convince me that it was true. <laughs> I mean, it was so unimaginably fast yeah. that, and Chief Judge Jacobs was an incredible get. Uh, you know, the Second Circuit argument is not the sort of centerpiece of the book, but do you want to say at least a word about uh, Chief Judge Jacobs Absolutely. is both a conservative uh, Republican who became a federal judge and has openly expressed skepticism about what he thinks of, I think, as impact civil rights litigation. Absolutely. So he had, there's a lecture, I assume it's still up on YouTube, uh, where that he gave to the Federalist Society, where he goes yeah. on and on about criticizing made-up cases and not liking cases that are just done for kind of to make a political point. And he was very critical of that. And I listened to that speech several times. Um, and I opened my, and, and you know, we were in good shape because obviously we'd had this, it's all about Edie's stupid thing uh, from the beginning of the case. One of the rules that I had for Edie is at a very early press conference in the case, she said something like, oh, I don't care about getting my money back. And I pulled her aside and I said, uh, I don't think so. I said, first of all, that's not even true. You do care about getting your money back. <laughs> Second of all, you can't say that. A case has to be a real case. You're not just bringing cases as, the as kind of a theoretical exercise. Mm -hmm. I never want you to hear you say again, you don't want your money back. And she agreed and, and didn't do it. Um, so we had kind of that set up the right way. Um, and I remember I began my Second Circuit argument by saying this case is about a, a widow who wants her money back. That was my first line in the Second Circuit, because I was very concerned uh, that, that Judge Jacobs would, would have that issue. Uh, subsequently, I've spoken to him about it, and he said it wasn't even an issue for him. He knew it was a real case. Mm -hmm. um, we had had some motion practice in the Second Circuit about getting an expedited appeal. I probably got the most expedited schedule uh, in the history of mankind. And that, those motions were decided by another judge, by Jerry Lynch, who's very, probably considered to be much more liberal uh, than Judge Jacobs, and we thought he was going to be on our panel because uh, we had heard a, a kind of a rumor that if he had wanted to, having decided the motions, he could be on the panel. And so when we saw Jacobs, I have to say, at first we were kind of shocked uh, and not thrilled. I had read uh, every constitutional case that Judge Jacobs had decided, and he had never before DOMA ever decided that a civil statute was unconstitutional. So. Uh, we thought we had an uphill battle, but uh, he really, he wrote probably one of the, I think it's one of the best opinions out there. And indeed, well, first of all, we may not have time to talk about this right away, but another one of the best opinions out there is in another one of your cases, which I think is District Judge Reeves' oh, opinion in Mississippi, which, time permitting, we'll talk about. Uh, uh, Robbie has been litigating uh, various different aspects of LGBT equality in the state of Mississippi, and, and before Obergefell, she had the Mississippi marriage equality case, and she got an opinion out of Judge Reeves there, which was just one for the history books. Um, but part of what Judge Jacobs did in that opinion, which is part of what queued you up into the front of the line for the Supreme Court, yeah. is that he did this extraordinary thing in holding that anti-gay discrimination gets strict scrutiny. Do you want to give a sort of layperson's explanation of what sure. that is? Sure. So uh, when a court looks at a statute, when someone makes an argument that a statute okay. treats one group of people differently than another, which is an equal protection case, a court has to decide what level of review or what level of scrutiny it's going to give to that statute. And there are basically three levels. Uh, uh, the lowest level is called rational basis, and I call it, Pam has a much better, Pam Clarin has a better description than I do, but I call it the spit test, <laughs> which means like basically anything can pass rational basis as long as there's some reason, even if it's made up after the fact, as long as it's not completely crazy, it passes rational basis. Then um, if a statute is passed uh, against certain groups, women, uh, people who are born uh, illegitimate when they were born, and then ultimately African Americans, which get strict scrutiny, there's higher tiers. And basically what the courts are saying is, look, the legislature really shouldn't be in the business of passing a law that treats women different than men or treats African Americans different than white people. And if they do, we're going to look at that law very closely. And there's got to be, to use a non-legal term, a damn good reason uh, for passing that law. And the reason has to be closely related to what the law actually does. Okay? And most cases, if they're under heightened or strict scrutiny, don't pass. Okay? And up until this point, uh, there had been no decision in the Second Circuit, we were very lucky about this, yeah. as to what level of scrutiny gay people get. 
All the other circuits, for the most part, had decided that gay people get rational basis, the, the spit test, um, and the Second Circuit hadn't decided. And we briefed the issue. We've been arguing, I've been arguing for years at that point that gay people should get some form of heightened scrutiny. It makes sense if you think about it. But all these other courts had said no. Uh, when we got to the Second Circuit argument, all that Judge Jacobs wanted to talk about was heightened scrutiny. And I remember being floored. I, I really, in a zillion years, I did not think that he was going to be the first judge out there to say that gay people uh, get heightened scrutiny. And that's exactly what he did. Um, and it had a huge impact, not only on cases throughout the country, but the, the Obama administration had taken the position that DOMA was unconstitutional because it got heightened scrutiny. So, that, so having a decision from the Second Circuit saying that shot our case. We were originally their last choice to go to the Supreme Court, and we shot up immediately to become their first choice. So you get the case to the Supreme Court. And this is your first argument before the court. There's an endless supply of lawyers who have an <laughs> endless supply of opinions about the best way to present the case, the best way to argue the case. Tell us, give us at least a few highlights of your preparation for the argument and your experience of actually standing before the court and doing the argument and then how you felt coming out of the court that day? So when I started practicing law, when Tobias and I started practicing law, there wasn't this thing that there is now called the SCOTUS Bar, which right. is this elite group of, of uh, Supreme Court lawyers who argue most of the major cases in the Supreme Court. Um, they are very much active players today. Um, and I knew that when this case, when the Supreme Court took our case, there was going to be a lot of opinions out there, uh, not only from the SCOTUS Bar, but that someone who was a member of the SCOTUS Bar should argue the case. Um, I had been, I had made probably the smartest decision I made in the case was to bring in a woman who was a professor at Stanford known as Pam Carlin uh, to help me on the case. Um, and she had been working with us for, for, at that point for months. And when the court took our case, I called her and I said, and this is almost a verbatim, uh, my verbatim memory of that conversation, I said to her, look, Pam, I said, I want you to know that I'm thinking about who should argue the case. Um, and before we go any further, I want you to know that assuming Edie agrees with me, that if I don't argue the case, you will. Pam had already argued a dozen or so cases at the Supreme Court. And I said, given that question, I want you to tell me who you think should argue. Do you think I should argue the case? Uh, and she said immediately, she said, look, she said, there are things about arguing in the Supreme Court that are different. Um, they're not hard to learn. You can learn them, but they're different. She said, we can teach you. And if this is your case. You've had it from day one. You should argue the case. Um, I don't think there are a lot of lawyers in this country, probably on this planet, who would give me that answer. Um, and so what we then did for the next three months is I got taught to argue the case. Um, and what you do is you sit in these rooms with a bunch of lawyers, and they all act like they're Supreme Court judges. Um, and their job is to beat the living you-know-what out of you um, for about 45 minutes, which is hard. And then when you're done, they spend about an hour and a half critiquing literally everything you said. Um, it it's certainly wasn't the most stress-free period of my life. Uh, some of those sessions were pretty tough. That We had a lot of strategic arguments. Um, in the first session, we were given advice uh, that the way to win was to de-gay, D-E-G-A-Y, the case. Um, and we strongly disagreed with that. But Edie got very upset at that in court, and we kind of had to explain to her that we thought our strategy was right. Uh, and that not only should we not de-gay the case, but the way to win was to re-gay the case. Um, <laughs> uh, but as far as I'm concerned, every other word out of my mouth in the Supreme Court should be gay, 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 gay. And did I mention we happen to be gay? Um, <laughs> So a lot of stuff like that happened. It was, it was again, it, it was not stress-free. Um, but, you know, I think by the time I got to the court, I really don't think there were any questions that I hadn't practiced at that point dozens and dozens of times. And you kind of want it to be almost like uh, muscle memory in your brain so that you hear it and you just give the answer without even thinking. So I'm going to ask one more question, then we want to bring you all into the conversation. And the way that we're going to do that um, if you all will just raise your hands, I can see you all very well. We're going to have a microphone coming around, and I'll pick on you, and, uh, and we'll get the microphone to you so that everybody can hear your question. And, and don't be shy, because if I can take Justice Scalia or Chief Justice Roberts' questions, exactly. I think I can probably take yours. So I think this is the, the perfect last question to end on, which is tell us about the experience of arguing in front of the court. So, you know, look, there's, it's, the Supreme Court building in the courtroom is incredible. 
Uh, there are all these traditions uh, and formalities that are related to the court that are different than any other court. The staff, by the way, the Supreme Court, is the nicest staff of any court in the country. Yeah, I mean, no they're question. unbelievable. Um, and so uh, before you argue, you go into this room called the Lawyer's Lounge, this beautiful room, and you get this lecture. I've heard it now because I've watched Supreme Court cases several times. Um, and they say to you, you know, if you have pencils, we can give you pencils. Uh, if you need cough drops, we'll give you cough drops. They say, please don't, please try to call the justices by their correct names. Good advice. Um, and then my favorite part of it is they always say, um, and if you need a sewing kit, we have a sewing kit. And every time I've heard them say that, I think to myself, oh my God, like if every, if I lose every button on my jacket and pants, I am just going to have to go in and hold it because the idea that I would try to sew something on my jacket in before this, I would like kill myself. There's no way that's happening. So you have this process where you're kind of waiting in, the, in this room and then they bring you into the courtroom and in the courtroom that day, courtroom's actually, I mean it's bigger than this, but it's not a very big room mm -hmm. uh, and it was packed. It was like the creme, to quote uh, Miss Jean Brody, it was the creme de la creme of Washington kind of culture. Everyone was there. Um, Edie was sitting like in the second row and all these Washington dignitaries were coming, Nancy Pelosi, and they were all coming, Valerie Jarrett, they're all kind of coming up to her to pay her respect, their respects. I remember thinking to myself, I can't look at this. Like if I look at it, it's gonna drive me crazy. And so I remember just kind of like st looking at my papers and facing forward so as not to be too distracted. Um, we had a joke on our team that I was gonna make sure that my hair that morning was fully DC hair. So a guy came to blow out my hair at 4 a.m. at the hotel, and the goal was that it had to be at least as high as Nancy Pelosi's. Uh, and I succeeded, look at that, that's after the argument, I totally succeeded. Um, and I've, I've shared this joke with Nancy Pelosi, who thinks it's very funny. Um, and, and, so, and then it starts, and I was the last lawyer to argue. Um, I was the only openly gay lawyer in two days of arguments in the Perry and the Windsor cases combined. Mm -hmm. um, and at first, if you listen to the tape, you could hear it. At first I get up and I'm like, I'm sure I was thinking to myself, oh my God. You know, here I am, Robbie Kaplan from Cleveland, Ohio. What in the world do I think I'm doing? And so you can kind of hear it a little bit in the opening. Uh, and then, you know, you kind of go into it like any other argument and it's, it's kind of not that different. Um, you have judges on your side, you have judges not on your side. You get questions from judges, you know, that don't necessarily agree with you. I've done that before. Um, and I remember just thinking, okay, you know, I've done this before. You don't, you're not on my side. I know how to answer these questions. And it just becomes kind of like any other argument. Um, and so, and it goes in lightning speed. Uh, and when it was over, I remember thinking, God, I can't believe it's over. I remember at the end, there's almost they kind of ran out of questions a little, yeah, bit. a little bit. And I remember thinking to myself, okay, you know, maybe I should say, if you have nothing further, I'll sit down. <laughs> uh, and that's right when the time went off and, and that's when the argument was over. And, and, and the thing I'll never forget until the day I die uh, is walking out of the courthouse that yeah. day. So we, I had been at the court a couple weeks earlier. They had suggested I come and kind of check things out. Uh, and someone who works for the court had said to me, do you need help getting out of the courtroom? And I thought they meant Edie, and I said, no, you know, Edie's fine, she can walk on her own. And I said, but, but what do you mean by that? And she said, well, you know, one of the other lawyers in the case has asked us for help kind of going out the back door. And I remember thinking when I heard that, I was like, we won this case. I was like, if the other side wants to go out the back door after the <laughs> argument, we won this case. Uh, and so I said to her, no, you know, thank you very much, I appreciate it, but I'm pretty sure Edie's gonna wanna go out the front door. Um, and we walked out the door that day and it was like, I mean, it's the closest Oliver Field to Mick Jagger. I mean, it was insane. You know, thousands of people screaming our name. It was incredible. Yeah. Please, let me know if you have questions. <laughs> Are you gonna steal a microphone? No. no oh, you're good, okay. Yes, sir, question over here. If you remember, do you remember any of the specific questions that the judges asked you and who asked it? Oh, totally. Are you kidding me? I'd like um, to hear some. So, so I think the best question or probably the most famous question is um, at one point uh, toward the end, and the Chief Justice I think was pretty exasperated with me at one point, and he, he tried to make the argument. There was this whole point where Justice Scalia actually started. He said, isn't it true, Ms. Kaplan, that there's been a sea change 
with respect to how the world sees gay people. And I thought to myself, I'm not going to disagree with that. You're totally right. And I was like, yes, I agree, Justice Scalia, there's been a sea change. And then there kind of was a, an, a discussion or an argument about what counted uh, for that sea change. And one of the things I'd been obsessed with in the case, truly obsessed, the way only I can be, dog with a bone, <laughs> was I was convinced that the justices were going to ask me, uh, DOMA was signed into law in 1996 by President Clinton. Uh, and I was convinced that they were going to say to me, Ms. Kaplan, what's your argument? Is your argument that President Clinton was a homophobe? Is that your position? Everyone who supported DOMA was a homophobe. And I was literally insane about it. So about four weeks or so before the argument, I actually called uh, the staff of President Clinton. And I basically, I can't believe I had the chutzpah to say this, but I said, look, um, I know that signing DOMA into law is not something that President Clinton is, is proud of. I know he regrets it. And I know that you know, he wishes he had done something different. And you know, everyone is going to have to meet their maker one day. And even President Clinton, I can't believe I said this, <laughs> even President Clinton is going to have to meet his maker. Um, but if he ever expresses that view, he's got to do it now. Because if he does it after the argument, it does me no good. Um, and to his great credit, I mean, really, we can all get too cynical about the world, I think. Uh, to his great credit, President Clinton wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post two weeks before the argument that said, I signed DOMA into law. It was the wrong thing to do. Uh, it was based on a fundamental misunderstanding of who gay people were and what their relationships meant. And I believe DOMA is unconstitutional. So that took care of my, is President Clinton a homophobe question? I didn't get that question. <laughs> But as a result, there's always an unintended consequence, right? So the unintended consequence is the Chief Justice said to me, well, Ms. Kaplan, clearly a result of that op-ed, isn't it a fact that politicians are falling over themselves to support your side of the case? That was pretty much the question. And almost every answer I gave during the argument was something that had been rehearsed to suffer the answer to this question. I remember um, uh, when Congress signed Dome into Law in 1996, the House report said, that they were doing that out of a moral disapproval, that's a direct quote, a moral disapproval of homosexuality. And I remember it popped into my head that I could flip from a moral disapproval to a moral understanding. And I actually even remember, you're like thinking in hyperspeed, but I remember thinking to myself, okay, I think this answer is right. I don't have, I can't go back and ask Pam Carlin if she agrees with me, but I'm pretty sure it's the right answer and I'm just gonna go for it. And so what I said to the chief is I said, no, it's not about politicians. It's not politicians falling over themselves. What's changed is the flip of the moral disapproval. Today we have a moral understanding that gay people are no different than anyone else. And the buzzer went off right then. That was the end of my argument. And it's the best moment of the argument. I mean, it's just, if you listen to the, the argument, it's, it's an extraordinary moment. It really is. Yes, sir. I believe at the time of the case there was some speculation or question as to where the Chief Justice would be on this issue because if I'm not mistaken, I believe he has a lesbian cousin. Correct. And so I'd be interested in knowing your thoughts about whether you thought about the vote, the position he might take, and why in fact he wound up taking the position he did. Well, I can talk about some of that. Only he can explain why he took the position he did. Um, look, there was an article that came out about the week of the argument. I don't know who did this. I was absolutely flabbergasted by it. A whole bunch of publicity about the fact that the chief had given this lesbian cousin of his a ticket to watch the argument. And it was all over the web. And I was like, oh, my. I was not happy about it because I knew he would not be happy about it. And I don't think he was. And I, and I remember I felt like I wanted to send a note saying, we had nothing to do with this, you know, just to be clear. <laughs> this, this wasn't me. Um, you know, so there was certainly given, you know, his decisions in other cases, there was some uh, speculation out there that he would kind of, kind of try to render a middle course here. Um, during the argument, it was pretty clear pretty quickly that he was not on our side. Um, he started the arguments by really arguing with me about the federalism question, and, and I think he was thinking that Justice Kennedy was leaning that way and trying to move Kennedy uh, his way. Um, you know, as to why, I mean, he has said why he voted the way he did. Um, the, I think the most interesting thing is if you look at the dissents in Windsor, uh, Justice Scalia wrote another classic, just like his dissent in Lawrence in 2003, he wrote this classic Scalia dissent where he said, this is going to lead to marriage equality. And he did this great black lining thing where he took the words and he showed how the words were going to lead to marriage equality. Um, and there's no question that that really did not make the chief happy. 
uh, because the chiefs hold a sentence basically that's not right and this is a case about federalism and it's not an issue like that and the decision in Windsor does not necessarily determine marriage equality nationwide. But of course, and thankfully, Justice Scalia was completely right about that, and it's in. And I have to say, if I can add one just editorial comment about the chief. Um, in the marriage equality case that we got this past spring, which was extraordinarily and directly dependent upon Robbie's victory in Windsor, uh, the chief is in dissent in that case as well, along with Justices Scalia, uh, uh, Thomas, and Alito. And not a single one of the four of them in their dissents spoke in any way about the lives of LGBT people or same-sex couples. And the kind of negative converse, right, the dog that doesn't bark to Robbie's dog with a bone about making the centerpiece of her case Edie is that when the dissenters explain their reasons for voting the way they did, they have not a thing to say about the actual people involved in this litigation because what could they say? What could they say? Next. Question in the back. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you would clarify if you had come out later in your law career and if you think now that we have DOMA defeated, that marriage equality is here, that you're working on the adoption cases, if we will get to job equality in our country, job protection, because I know it's still a huge issue everywhere, even I think in Pennsylvania. Yeah. yeah. Um, so in terms of, so when we, when we first filed the case, we did a phone call uh, with, uh, I brought the ACLU into the case, so we did a call with their donors, and Edie was on the call, and someone said to her, you know, what is it like, it must take a lot of courage to be a plaintiff. And Edie said, she would give classic Edie perfect answer and she said look she said you know in your life you're constantly coming out uh, and you're constantly deciding in any particular circumstance do I tell this taxi driver I'm gay do I tell this doctor I'm gay you know do I tell these people I'm on vacation with who are sitting next to me at dinner you know constantly making those decisions she's like I, I was pretty out as a lesbian before this case she's like but it's one thing to be out as a lesbian and it's another thing to be the out lesbian who happens to be suing the United States of America <laughs> um, and so now I'm the lawyer who represented the out lesbian who happens to be suing me, so I'm pretty out there myself. Um, in terms of my career, you know, I, you know it's really, a, I think, a function of the times. I, I was out to different people at various points in my life. Um, my firm, I'm proud to say, uh, never had an issue with it. And, um, you know, from day one at Paul Weiss, certainly my friends knew, my close friends knew when I was up for partner, um, I brought my then girlfriend to the partner's dinner. I mean, it, so I was not closeted. But did I go around in 1998 like telling adversaries in cases that I was a lesbian? No, definitely not. Now, as you know, I have no choice. Uh, pretty much any adversary and any judge in the country knows who I am. Um, in terms of uh, job equality, I think the short answer to your question is yes, we're going to get there. Um, first of all, let me be clear, I don't think any government today in the United States of America can discriminate against anyone because they're gay. I think that's what Obergefell and Windsor mean. Mm -hmm. um, and I would be, I think, any government who tries to fire an employee because they're gay is going to lose that case. So the, the big issue, of course, is private employers. <clears throat> the EEOC, under the great leadership uh, of the Obama administration, has taken the position uh, that it is illegal that uh, firing an employee because they're gay is a form of gender discrimination, it violates Title VII, and then it is already illegal. Uh, that is something that's gonna be litigated in the courts. It's, it's just almost a new theory, and it, there's gonna, obviously gonna be litigation about it. Uh, the obvious way to solve the problem, the cleanest way to solve the problem, is to get legislation through Congress. Um, this is not a Congress that likes to really pass legislation about anything. Uh, today, so I don't think the immediate prospects are that good, but we need to work hard on that. Um, and short of Congress, you have to make sure, you know, that we have state laws. So a lot of states, like New York, Pennsylvania does not. Does not. So you need to get a law through. That should be doable, and it's really important to get a law through the Pennsylvania legislature saying you can't do it in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know that. That's actually, I'm shocked by that. that yeah, that lest anyone in this audience was not aware, there Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Harrisburg, a number of other cities have city ordinances that make anti-LGBT discrimination illegal. Those are good to have on the books. The remedies are not as robust as they might be. But as a matter of state law, in the state of Pennsylvania, the, the great state that we're all sitting in right now, 
you can fire LGBT employees all day long and there's no remedy under state law. Yeah. Uh, that's and amazing. We can do something about that. I would have thought that Pennsylvania was, was differently situated than the state of Mississippi uh, in that regard. So you, but you, it turns out not. You guys, you guys need to do something about that. Uh, gentleman in the back. In view of your experience with this case, how important is it now that the United States Supreme Court not have a president of the United States who's a right-wing Republican next year? Uh, let me answer the question in a way that I think is, uh, well, let me answer the question. Uh, <laughs> look, you know, these Obergefell and Windsor are wonderful victories, but I think we can't lose sight of the fact that they're one vote, there's only a one vote margin. Uh, you know, there was a lot of speculation in Obergefell that maybe the chief would join, that there'd be, you know, at least six votes. Uh, in reality, we weren't even close. We can tell that in his dissent. Um, and that's not enough. It shouldn't be, these shouldn't be 5-4 cases. They should be 9-0 cases. Um, and so that needs to change. And, and I don't have to tell you, the, there are a lot of people on the court uh, who probably, depending on who gets elected, are going to want to leave. And it's very important uh, who appoints them. Uh, I personally would prefer that it be Hillary Clinton, but that's my own personal opinion. But, but it is very important that we get people, I mean, actually the incredible thing is the justice on the Supreme Court, and Tobias, you should confirm this, the, uh, who were the dissenters, are far to the right on this issue of every other federal court out there. Yeah. I mean, federal judges, through, judges throughout this country uh, who were appointed by Republicans are far more moderate uh, with respect to LGBT rights than the four dissenters on the Supreme Court. And so, uh, you know, it'd be yeah. nice if we had a change in personnel. Yeah. Yes, sir. I've got a microphone for you. Uh, relevant to the uh, private employer uh, uh, case, how do you deal with the Hobby Lobby case and, the pri and that issue? Okay. So, so, look, here's what I think. I think let's start with the easy part. The easy part is Kim Davis. Uh, Kim Davis was the best gift to the gay community we've had in years. Um, uh, first of all, she's a Looney Tune. Uh, second of all, her arguments are ridiculous. Not a single judge who's looked at her arguments think there's anything to them, and that's not a surprise. Uh, she's surrounded by really hateful people, uh, and obviously hateful people, you know, who wear KKK robes and things like that. Uh, and then the, the icing on the cake is that she tells a lie about a private meeting with the Pope. I mean, it doesn't get much better than that. Um, so, you know, I, there are always going to be people like Kim Davis. You know, they're all, you know, it's kind of the current version of Andy Warhol. Everyone wants their, their two minutes of fame. There are always going to be people who want their two minutes of fame and who kind of feel that the way to get that is to, I mean, I think Kim Davis is loving it now. She's all of a sudden, she's on TV all the time. Uh, you know, I, I think there's going to be that. But in reality, Gay couples are getting married in the county in Kentucky where she's the clerk, and that's what really matters. Um, so I think that issue is, is, you know, and there are similar issues in Alabama. It's the same kind of thing. I think that issue, Roy Moore, is similar to Kim Davis. But I, I think for the most part that's more smoke than fire. Then if you go to the other um, kind of extreme, it's businesses. Can businesses uh, or should businesses be able to discriminate about who they serve? And there, I think it's really, I don't have a legal answer, I have a business answer, which is most, certainly any public company and really any big company in America has no desire, zero desire, to have a store manager be able to make decisions that they're not going to serve, you know, they're not going to sell ice cream to two girls because they have two moms. There's not a business in the country that has any appetite for that. It's, it's bad business. It's stupid. Um, and so you're not really, it's incredible, in some of these RIFRA laws, the most effective opposition is the business community, because they're like, we don't want this. We don't want our people to have the choice. Um, so you're going to get cases, but you're going to get cases in these kind of one-off sole proprietorships, the one that Tobias litigated, for example, um, which he should tell you about. Um, and one of those cases is going to get to the Supreme Court. Um, and what the Supreme Court, I don't think, I mean, in Hobby Lobby, there's a, a statement, I, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, from Alito, right. that it says it doesn't apply to anti-discrimination laws. In race discrimination. In terms of race discrimination. Uh, assuming there's an anti-LGBT discrimination law in the books, it's hard to imagine that they're going to say it's okay. I mean, our country does not have a great legacy uh, with using religious arguments to discriminate against people based on who they are. 
But the answer to that question is going to very much depend on what the other gentleman said, which is who's on the court at the time that the case gets to them. And, you know, I'll add two very quick uh, uh, pieces to that. One is whatever answer we come up with about when a person should be able to claim a special privilege to break the law based upon their religious uh, conviction, we have to be comfortable with it across the board. Right? We have to have an answer which we're comfortable with when it comes to turning Jews away from a business, right. when it comes to turning women away from a business, when it comes to turning people of color away from a business, whatever the case may be. And the second thing is, you know, there's a big difference between religious accommodation where nobody gets hurt, where it's, it's an accommodation that you, you alter the rules of the administration of a program, whatever the case may be, but there's no harms to third parties. And a case where people are getting hurt and where the hurt is either material or it's the dignitary harm of being told we don't take your kind here. And, and if you haven't ever had that experience, it's, it's difficult to appreciate what it really means to you. And I think that there are signs, even in the Hobby Lobby case, that if put to it, the court right. would not be prepared to endorse the proposition that you can impose those kinds of harms upon, upon third parties, because that would be a profound thing to say. Yes, ma'am, in the middle. Yeah. Got a microphone coming for you. Um, I'm from University Heights, Cleveland Heights, and I went to Cleveland Heights High, and I graduated Ooh. in 1969. Uh, and when I was in school, I don't remember anybody coming out as a lesbian. And because I think you're probably from a similar background than I am, and maybe a little bit younger, I would like you Just to speak bit. to um, how it was growing up, where you went to high school, sure. mm -hmm. when you graduated, and the influences on what made you decide to come out as a lesbian and to become a lawyer. That's great. Um, so, I'm also saying that because my nephew and his partner, David, are getting married in Wisconsin this summer. Wow, congratulations. And when my mother found out that Ryan was gay, she said it added another dimension to his personality, and she is 91. Wow. wow. <laughs> So I grew up in, in the, uh, the eastern suburbs of Cleveland as well. I went to Hawkins School. I graduated in 1988. Um, and I certainly had thoughts about being gay in high school. There's no question about it. Um, but I never would have said or done anything about it. Um, I didn't know anyone in high school who was gay. I, it turns out a lot of my friends in high school were, in fact, gay. Uh, but none of us knew that. And we, again, we all, no one talked about it. We all had boyfriends or girlfriends or uh, you know, of the opposite sex. Tell, tell them who you went to the high school prom with. Yeah, oh, so my date <laughs> at the high school prom was this guy by the name of Aaron Belkin, who is a very prominent uh, professor and gay activist, particularly on the military issues. <laughs> um, and there's this great picture in my book in the insert of the two of us dressed for the junior prom. We both look very cute, I must say. Um, and we, of course, we never talked about it. So that was the situation. Then I got to college. Um, and I went to Harvard, my wife went to Smith, and this is something we've been arguing about for years. I claimed to her that there was not a single lesbian while I was at Harvard. Um, Rachel says that everyone at Smith was a lesbian when she went to <laughs> Smith. So, uh, and she thinks I'm completely insane, but again, it wasn't that different. I mean, I had gay male friends. I had some, I knew one story that I talk about in the book about a woman whose mom disowned her that I'd heard in college that scared the living you know what out of me. Um, so again, it was like I'd had the thoughts. It turns out that my college roommates, um, many, the majority of us ended up being lesbians, but again, we never really talked about it, other than some kind of typical college psychodrama. Uh, we never really talked about it or were open about it. And then law school, the same thing. I mean, I, you know, I, again, I'd had the same thoughts, but it, it took me till the end of law school. I really, to, it took three years to screw up the courage to actually do or say anything about it. Um, and then I had that experience, you know, with my parents, which wasn't ideal. Um, why did I want to become a lawyer? You know, I like to talk, in case you haven't noticed. <laughs> um, and there's this great story. There's these letters that my grandmother wrote when I was very little saying how one day I said to her, she said, Robbie, she said, do, you know, do you have to talk all the time? You know, can you just stop for a second? And I said to her, but Grandma, I love to talk. <laughs> um, and I had the idea in my head, someone gave me the idea that if you were a lawyer, you got to, you got to talk for a living. So I, pretty young, I, I knew I wanted to be a lawyer. Um, when I was 10, this is a little scary, I planned, I knew I wanted to move to New York. My mom had a subscription to New York Magazine and I read it and I was like, this is where I want to be. And I planned out that I would go to an Ivy League college and then I would go to law school in New York and that's how I would move. 
Uh, and that's what I did, which the idea that a 10-year-old would even have that thought, I mean, my son's nine, I can't imagine him having a thought like that. <laughs> it's a little scary, frankly. Question back there. So how and why did Edie find her way to you? So what happened is I actually got lucky. So she went, when she, there was this wonderful documentary made about her and Thea called Edie and Thea, Very Long Engagement. And this shows what the world was like even in 2009. Edie felt that that documentary proved that she had a documented marriage, to use her words. Yeah. Again, who today would think that you needed a documentary to prove you're married, right? You're married. <laughs> But that's the way the world was. And, and so she went around to a lot of the gay groups and said, would you do my case? And she was turned down. Um, I wasn't a part of those conversations, so I don't know exactly what was said, but she was definitely turned down. And in her words, she felt indignant. One of the many reasons she was the ultimate, the perfect client is because she used words like indignant. Um, and she said she was indignant that she had to pay this money and she wanted it back. And so she started asking a friend of hers, this guy who had actually brought her and Thea to Toronto to get married, a guy, an activist by the name of Brendan Fay, and he'd been very active, he's very active in Catholic, the Catholic gay group known as Dignity, and he's a good friend of a friend of mine who's a headhunter, kind of a lawyer headhunter, uh, and my friend called me and said, would you give her a call? And I knew immediately who she was. Um, I called her on the phone, and she was pretty hard of hearing even then, so I said, I'll, I'll come over the next day, uh, and that's how it started. She lives about four blocks away from me, so it wasn't very hard. So I have to tell you, I have been privileged to have Robbie as both a friend and a colleague for uh, just about 15 years now. I was going to say about 50 years. I 15, think. 15 years. <laughs> and I thought I knew Robbie very well. And I am a civil rights lawyer and a scholar and a law professor. I work on these issues. I thought I knew this case very well. And I learned a ton oh, about you. my friend and about this litigation reading this book. And it is a gripping story. And so whatever other, other questions you have that remain unanswered, they are in this book. <laughs> and Robbie is far too much of a class act to pitch her own book, but I'm going to pitch it for her. Um, and I thank you all for coming tonight. And please join me in thanking Robbie. Thank you. Thank you so much.